This is Space Time, Series 26, Episode 90, for broadcast on the 20th of July, 2023. Coming up on Space Time, the brightest gamma ray burst ever detected, two planets appearing to be in the same orbit, and India launches its latest mission to the Moon. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers believe they may just have observed the brightest gamma ray burst ever detected. Gamma ray bursts are the most powerful explosions in the universe since the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. They mark the core collapse supernova deaths of massive stars into black holes. This particular gamma ray burst, catalogued as 221009A, occurred approximately 2.4 billion light years away in the northern constellation of Sagi the Arrow. The explosion was captured by the gamma ray burst monitor aboard NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, which searches the skies looking for gamma ray bursts. A report in the Astrophysical Journal Letters and on the pre-press physics website archive.org describes GRB 221009A as one of the nearest and possibly most energetic gamma ray bursts ever found. One of the study's authors, Peter Varez from the University of Alabama in Huntsville, says the gamma ray burst was so extremely bright you would only expect to see something like it once every 10,000 years. Varez says the team routinely detect gamma ray bursts at the rate of about five a week, and they keep their eye out for anything special that comes their way. And this one was so bright, the instrument simply couldn't keep up with a huge number of incoming photons. So most of Varez's work actually involved figuring out how to reconstruct the lost counts. Gamma ray bursts come from random directions in the sky. So, the Gamma Ray Burst Monitor needs to watch as much of the sky as possible all the time. The instrument itself consists of 12 detectors made of sodium iodide designed to catch X-rays and low-energy gamma rays and two detectors made of bismuth germanite for high-energy gamma rays. When the gamma rays enter the detector, they interact with crystals in the instrument. And the more energetic the gamma ray, the more light that's produced. By seeing which crystals light up, the gamma ray burst monitor can tell the direction of the burst. So far, Fermi's discovered well over 3,500 gamma ray bursts, but GRB 221009A is by far the brightest ever detected. Perez says this event marked the death of a star at least 30 times more massive than the Sun. And as it collapsed down to form a stellar mass black hole, it launched a very fast jet close to the speed of light, and that jet produced the gamma ray burst. At later times, during what's known as the afterglow, gamma ray bursts become visible at other wavelengths, ranging from radio or optical through to X-rays. But this event was so bright, the afterglow showed up in the gamma ray burst monitor, which is very uncommon, and the authors were able to follow it for almost three hours. This report from NASA TV. The Gamma Ray Burst Monitor is one of the instruments on the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, designed to detect gamma ray bursts. Gamma ray bursts can be observed in every corner of the universe, emitted from the extremely energetic collapse of massive stars and the merging cores of dead stars. The Gamma Ray Burst Monitor, also known as GBM, is an instrument used to detect these bright flashes and give scientists information from across the universe. The GBM uses a few simple processes to collect data. There are 12 low-energy detectors and two higher-energy detectors pointed in different orientations that together cover the whole sky. When gamma rays enter these detectors, they interact with crystals in the instrument. The more energetic the gamma ray, the more light is produced in the crystals. By seeing which crystals light up, the GBM can tell which direction the gamma ray bursts are coming from. This process is called localization. Shining about a quadrillion times brighter than the sun, gamma rays are the first light to be detected from a gamma ray burst. Rapid localization informs other telescopes, both on the ground and in space, where to look. GBM observations of the brightest explosions in the universe allow scientists to better understand these unique sources. Gamma rays are the highest energy form of light. There's the light we see with our eyes, but there are lots of other types of light. 
Gamma rays are the most energetic form of light, the most powerful. Gamma rays are the part of what we call the electromagnetic spectrum, which starts in radio at very long wavelengths, goes through optical, then through X-rays, and then gamma rays are the very highest energy form of, of that type of radiation. The reason that it's important to look at the high energy gamma rays is that many objects, the most violent and some of the most interesting objects in the universe, emit most of their light in this high energy gamma ray part. And the only thing that can generate gamma rays are incredibly violent events, incredibly energetic events. And we're talking you know, stars exploding and neutron stars with uh, really strong magnetic fields and, and really exotic and, and strange objects like that. It's like a Christmas tree. It's shining and it's uh, flaring and there are eruptions every day. Gamma ray bursts being an example, something that for a brief instant of time outshines the entire rest of the universe. These are the biggest explosions in the universe. This is space time. Still to come, two planets which appear to be in the same orbit, and India launches its third mission to the moon. All that and more still to come on space time. Astronomers have found a distant star system containing two exoplanets sharing the same orbit. Scientists made the discovery using ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array Radio Telescope in Chile. What the authors actually saw was a cloud of debris that appears to be sharing the same orbit as a planet going around a host star. They believe this debris could be the building blocks of a new planet in the process of forming, or the remains of one which had already formed but had been destroyed. The discovery was made in the PDS-70 system, a very young Titori star in the constellation Centaurus located some 370 light-years away. Titori stars are a class of variable stars that are less than 10 million years old. They're found near molecular gas and dust clouds and identified by their optical variability and strong chromospheric lines. Titori stars are pre-main sequence. They're in the process of contracting to form main sequence stars along the Hayashi track, a luminosity-temperature relationship obeyed by infant stars less than three solar masses in the pre-main sequence phase of their stellar evolution. It ends when a star about half a solar mass in size or larger develops a radiative zone, or when a smaller star commences nuclear fusion in its core, signifying it's on the main sequence. PDS-70 has a mass of 0.76 times that of the Sun and is approximately 5.4 million years old. The star has a protoplanetary disk containing two nascent Jupiter-like exoplanets named PDS-70b and C. By analysing archival ALMA observations of the system, the authors detected a cloud of debris in the PDS-70b's orbit where Trojans would be expected to exist. Now, Trojans occupy the so-called Lagrangian L4 and L5 zones. They're two extended regions in a planet's orbit approximately 60 degrees ahead and 60 degrees behind the planet, a place where the combined gravitational pull of the planet and the star it's orbiting can trap material. While studying these two regions of PDS-70b's orbit, astronomers detected a faint signal from one of them, indicating that a cloud of debris with a mass roughly two times that of our moon might reside there. The authors believe that this cloud of debris could point to an existing Trojan, or maybe even a planet in the process of forming. If confirmed, the discovery, reported in the journal Astronomy and Astrophysics, will be the strongest evidence yet confirming that two exoplanets can share the one orbit. Now, it's important to point out this is different from binary planetary systems, like the Earth and the Moon, or Pluto and Charon. They orbit around a common centre of gravity called a barycenter. In the case of Pluto and Charon, that barycenter is outside of Pluto, and therefore it's considered a binary system. In the case of the Earth and the Moon, the Barry Centre is still inside the Earth, and so astronomers say it's a case of the Moon orbiting the Earth. 
The study's lead author, Olga Bal Salabre Ruza from the Center for Astrobiology in Madrid, says that two decades ago it was predicted in theory that pairs of planets with similar masses could share the same orbit around a star, the so called Trojans or orbital planets. But this is the first evidence in favor of that idea. Trojans, rocky bodies in the same orbit as a planet, are common in our solar system. The most famous example being the Trojan asteroids of Jupiter. More than 12,000 rocky bodies in the same orbit around the Sun as the gas giant. When asteroids were first discovered in Jupiter's orbit, they were named after the heroes of the Trojan War, giving rise to the name Trojans to refer to this class of object. This is space time. Still to come, India launches its latest mission to the Moon, and later in the science report, paleontologists identify a new species of iguanodon discovered in Spain. All that and more still to come on Space Time. India has successfully launched its latest mission to the moon. The Chandrayaan-3 spacecraft was launched aboard an LV Mark III M4 rocket from the Shatish Dhawan Space Center in Shiriakota on the Bay of Bengal coast in the southern state of Andhra Pradesh. The 44-metre tall three-stage LV Mark III M4 is the new name given to the Mark III version of the Indian Space Research Organization's heavy lift geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle, or GSLV. Real-time programs activated. L110 VSPP open. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Lift off normal. P1 Here we have a majestic lift off of LBM 3 M4 rocket carrying India's prestigious Chandrayaan 3 spacecraft. P2 tracking. As the rocket is soaring through the clear skies, every second moving closer to the accomplishment of the most important milestone in its mission to moon. Every Indian witnessing the launch live is content with the feeling of watching history in the making. The S-200 motors thrusting simultaneously generating a peak thrust of close to 6,000 kN in vacuum. They are made of HTPV based solid propellant, 204.5 tons in each strap-on. Close to 2 tons of propellant being burnt each second. Apart from the strap-ons, the core stage has also commenced its operation. This stage, based on combination of hypergolic earth storable liquid propellants UH-25 and N204. Now the S-200s have been separated. L110 stage performance normal. The trajectory of launch vehicle is closely following the prediction. Payload fairing separated. We are 220 seconds past the launch time. Current altitude is 135 kilometers. In the 200 seconds of its operation, the L110 stage carries the rocket up to 175.5 kilometers altitude and imparts a relative velocity of 4.18 kilometers per second. That is 250 kilometers every minute. L110 stage performance normal. Geo stage ignition is authorized. L110 stage thrust cut off and separated to C25 ignition command. C25 ignition confirmed. That's a piece of really good news that the third stage has started its operation. The C25 stage has been ignited. The 3,900 kilogram Chandrayaan 3 spacecraft is the third mission under the Chandrayaan program. Chandrayaan meaning mooncraft in Sanskrit. Like its Chandrayaan 2 predecessor, it comprises a lander named Vikram, meaning valor in Sanskrit, and a rover named Pragyan, meaning wisdom. The mission orbited the Earth six times, each time becoming more elliptical and gaining speed, before flinging itself on a month-long lunar trajectory. Chandrayaan 3 is expected to land near the lunar south pole on August the 23rd. Once on the surface, the rover will roll down the lander and explore the surrounding terrain during an expected mission lifespan of about 14 Earth days. India's last attempt, Chandrayaan-2, failed four years ago, crashing heavily under the lunar surface after what was thought to have been a communications glitch during the landing sequence. 
Only the United States, Russia and China have successfully achieved controlled landings on the lunar surface. In 2014, India successfully placed the satellite into orbit around Mars. And next year, it plans on sending its first manned mission into Earth orbit. Moon. This familiar object in the night sky has inspired the imagination of astronomers and ordinary people alike. From time immemorial, humans have marveled at the beauty of the moon used it to count time and navigate the high seas. In modern times, Moon, the only natural satellite of the Earth, has acquired added importance due to the belief that Moon is the key to our understanding of the evolution of the solar system in general and Earth in particular. Besides, Moon's precious resources and low gravity have further endeared it to humans. India, a major space-faring nation, has conducted a detailed exploration of the Moon through its Chandrayaan program. The country has sent two robotic spacecraft to orbit the Moon and to take a repeated look at its surface. Chandrayaan-1 demonstrated India's ability to reach the surface of the moon at a place and time of its choice. And with it, India became the fourth country to reach the surface of the moon in November 2008. Besides, Chandrayaan-1's conclusive discovery of water on the moon in 2009 was praised as a path-breaking discovery. The follow-on mission Chandrayaan-2 had an orbiter, a lander called Vikram and a rover named Pragyan. In the past four years, the orbiter has repeatedly observed the lunar surface and even today is working satisfactorily. Now, 3,900 kilograms, Chandrayaan-3 spacecraft is being sent to the moon with the objective of making yet another focused attempt to slowly land on the lunar surface and to explore it with the help of a rover. Following the spacecraft launched by India's most capable rocket, LVM-3, the Chandrayaan-3 lander carrying a rover within it will be carried into an orbit around the moon by the propulsion module. A little later, the lander will separate from that module and will attempt to make a soft landing in the south polar region of the moon. This region is of intense interest as it has many permanently shadowed craters which could contain water ice and precious minerals. Chandrayaan-3 lander has four scientific instruments or payloads of which one will study the moon quakes while the other one studies as to how the surface of the moon allows heat to flow through it. The third one will study the plasma environment near the moon's surface and the fourth instrument will enable scientists to measure the distance between the Earth and Moon very accurately. The two instruments on the rover help us study the composition of the Moon's surface using X-rays and laser respectively. While the lander and rover will be in direct contact with each other, the propulsion module circling the Moon will observe the light coming from Earth, the only planet which we know which is definitely teeming with light. This observation will help in understanding the nature of distant planets circling stars other than the Sun. Let us wish them well in this great endeavor called Chandrayaan-3. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news insights this week with the Science Report. A new study warns that seabirds are predominantly being exposed to dangerous marine plastic pollution beyond the national jurisdiction of the coastal nations they breed in. Many seabirds, especially some that are already considered threatened, are now at high risk of accidentally ingesting plastic pollution. 
A report in the journal Nature Communications compared marine plastic density estimates across the world's oceans using tracking data across 77 petrel species. They found high exposure risks in areas of the Mediterranean and Black Seas, as well as in the high seas off the coast of the United States, Japan and the UK. The authors say countries need to work together in order to tackle the growing pollution problem in the high seas. Scientists have found that the people of ancient Iberia during the Copper Age some four and a half thousand years ago were governed by a female rather than a male. The findings, published in the journal Scientific Reports, shows that the Ivory Lady was the big kahuna of the day. The woman in question, originally assumed to have been a young man but now redubbed the Ivory Lady, was buried in a tomb filled with the largest collection of rare and valuable items in the region. These included ivory tusks, high-quality flint, ostrich eggshells, amber and a rock crystal dagger. The findings reveal the high status which women could hold in this ancient society. Paleontologists have identified a new species of iguanodon duckbill dinosaur at the Talam Formation dig site in Spain. A report in the journal Vertebrate Paleontology says the newly discovered species Calvaris rapidus lived during the last 100,000 years before the end of the Cretaceous period 66 million years ago, making it one of the last non-avian dinosaurs to ever walk on the planet. The new genus and species were identified from a single fossilised metatarsal bone. Iguanodonts could be either bipedal or quadrupedal, they were large herbivorous hadrosaurs that often grazed in huge herds and are commonly referred to as the cows of the age of dinosaurs. They colonised every continent and left a rich fossil record spanning the Middle Jurassic right through to the end of the Cretaceous. The name Calvaris was derived from the Catalan word Calvari, meaning suffering. Remember, being at the end of the Cretaceous means you were around when the big asteroid hit. A new report in the Journal of the American Medical Association warns that inaccurate labelling of melatonin is making accidental overdoses more likely. Melatonin is used to aid your ability to fall asleep, not necessarily sleep quality or your ability to stay asleep. However, the American Medical Association report found significant variability in the amount of the drug per dose compared to what was listed on the packet. And that poses a risk for kids because of their size. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics says the problem seems to be that melatonin is treated as an over-the-counter dietary supplement rather than a medication. Melatonin, as it is basically, is apparently safe. And a lot of people take it to try and help them sleep. They're sort of having trouble getting to sleep or having a good sleep. Fine, the tests have shown that it might help you calm down a bit, go to sleep. It won't necessarily improve your actual sleep, but it might set you off on the path to nodding off. The issue is, is that because this is a herbal product and it's therefore regarded as a food rather than a medicine, the restrictions on it and the regulatory authorities are a bit different to what might happen with a medicine. A medicine would be a lot more severe, a lot more restrictive. So this is sort of put out there in packages which might not be always according to the best practices. And a particular study found that some of these bottles of melanin, where they're also in gummies, that the Packaging of these things is very variable. They were saying that probably one milligram of melatonin is enough to help you get to sleep. But a lot of these packages, some of them have, they say they have one, or they just one in particular, they said they had three milligrams as the dose, but they actually had 10. And there are others, of course, that say they have melatonin but have nothing in them. That's not that uncommon, actually, with a lot of herbal and vitamin products. They don't actually, regulations are not always up to scratch, and there's a lot of abuse of those regulations. Suggesting that, especially with kids, and yeah, melatonin, I've known people who use melatonin on kids, young kids, basically almost toddlers. And because of this variation in the dosages that you don't know about, it can be quite dangerous. What happens when you have too much? If you take too much, you can have sort of, uh, quite ironically, it can actually stop you going to sleep. And that it can stimulate your brain, you're getting sort of nightmares, disrupted sleep, pa- not panic attacks, but sort of close to it. And therefore, it's actually doing the wrong thing as far as what melatonin is supposed to do. And in some cases, it can be very serious, especially as we say with kids. And if you have an overdose with kids, etc., you, you can hospitalize them. They get a very severe reaction to it. And they say that in America, they know that a number of pediatric melatonin overdoses reported to poison control centers. And between two 
2012 and 2021, that nine-year period, that increased by about fivefold. So perhaps a lot more people using melatonin and using incorrectly packaged melatonin. And it's that most kids, they get over it. They might have some pain and that sort of thing or whatever. But about 15% of them have to go to hospital to be looked after. So you've got to be very careful with this stuff. I mean, it's promoted as being helpful. It's natural. It's innocuous, etc. But not necessarily the case. And part of the issue is the dosage that you might be taking. Obviously, with any product, our poison is also always dependent on dosage. But um, everything is a drug. This, it just depends on the amount. That's right. Yeah. And in this particular case, though, you could be misunderstanding how much of the product is actually in of what you're taking. So you're being misled. You might be taking none, so that becomes a placebo effect. Or you might be taking too much and can, can therefore have those negative downsides. So you've got to be very careful with this stuff. I don't know if you can get melatonin from a reputable supplier. I don't know well, for the weather think situation. The stuff that you're buying at the pharmacy is reputable. One would think. Um, not necessarily. <laughs> I mean, pharmacies oh, sell a lot of homeopathic stuff, right? Yeah, I and, uh, quite understood that, but yes, I know. Yeah, you would hope it would be sort of reputable stuff that's coming into a pharmacy, but I don't know. I mean, I, I just be, I, I don't even know how you'd necessarily sort of test it and assess it. But Whether it works or not, I guess, when you take it. Whether it works or not, I mean, it's sworn by, by a lot of people, uh, a lot of people I know. I don't take it. I tend to fall asleep pretty quickly. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 